Let's start at the end of the week, if we could, on Friday with the jobs reports. Came in a little bit softer than when anticipated, 150,000 or 180,000. Are we starting to see that slowdown that we need in order to get inflation under control? I think it's hard to know. You know, there was an automobile strike. There's a lot of fluctuation uh, from uh, month to month. The labor market's not quite red hot in the way that it was a few months ago. But whether it's in a place that's consistent with sustainable inflation I, at 2 percent, I think that's uh, still very much uh, in, uh, in doubt, though this was a this was a favorable number, but I don't think anybody should overinterpret it. Well, talking about overinterpreting, what about what uh, Chair Jay Powell had to say actually earlier in the week? Because the markets certainly ran with it. They basically took it as saying, we're pausing, we're not going up anymore, we're, happy days are here again. Are the markets overreacting to think about where we are and what actually he said? I think it's unfortunate when there's excessive volatility in either direction in response to uh, Fed meetings. I think smoother communications that induces less sharp volatility would uh, probably be would probably be better, though it's obviously a very difficult role that the chairman uh, has. I am not confident of a central element in the Fed's thinking, which is they can regard higher long-term rates as some kind of contractionary impulse to which the right response is for their policy to be easy. If, for example, the higher rates are coming from a sense that we're going to have larger and more expansionary uh, fiscal uh, policy or a sense that we're going to have more robust investment demand down the road, that is not a basis for lowering uh, rates or having easier financial conditions. Even if it comes from an increase in the term premium, it's not really clear how big the in impact of changes in the term premium is on stock prices or business investment uh, decisions. So I think the argument that was being made is a bit less ironclad than the chairman suggested. And I think that, in general, the kind of very dramatic response we've seen in interest rates this week, the longer term, and in stock prices make me not as certain as many people that the job of containing inflation is over and uh, that the war is done. They're right to be watchful and waiting, but I think people are a little bit in too much of a hurry to declare that we've done all the monetary policy that we need to do. What do you think about the job the Treasury is doing managing this? We have something of a dispute right now between Stanley Druckenmill on the one hand and Janet Yellen on the other about exactly how they're terming the debt. So I don't want to get I don't want to get in the middle of uh, of that dispute, but I'll say this: if you take the combined job that the Treasury and Fed did at the moment of maximum opportunity to issue long-term debt in 2021, when rates were on the floor, they were busy stretching out, uh, terming in uh, the debt, mostly due to quantitative easing that wasn't being offset. The Fed's lost probably hundreds of billions of dollars in uh, market value of its portfolio. The Fed's remission back to the Treasury is much smaller than it could have been. Uh, because of uh, those losses and is actually turning negative, and that negative isn't showing up uh, in uh, the fiscal accounts. So I don't think our debts have been uh, well managed over the last few years. I think a corporate treasurer who had been moving all through 2021 to uh, floating rate uh, debt or more floating rate debt would kind of have surprised his CEO and maybe wouldn't be looking so strong 
uh, today. Well, obviously, the reason we have the debt is because we're spending more money than we're taking in. Let's talk about the taking in part, because we had developments this week where the House of Representatives, and the Republicans in the House of Representatives, had a new bill for uh, support for Israel, and they said they were going to pay for it by cutting back on something you had been advocating, actually, which is more resources for the IRS, even though CBO, Congressional Budget Office, said actually it's going to increase the deficit. I know you feel strongly about this. So, look, we have to be a serious country in a very dangerous world. And that means promptly voting financial support for Israel and for Ukraine. And if we don't, it's going to have a very important effect on American leadership. In terms of how that is uh, financed, the single most foolish way to finance that would be with further cuts in uh, the IRS uh, budget. They would raise the deficit and debt over time as we collected less revenue. They would exacerbate inequality because the principal beneficiaries would be affluent people who had cheated on uh, their taxes. And they would demoralize the overall tax system where the vast majority of people are honest. But Larry, it's a dangerous world. It's also a divisive world. And we're seeing some of that division right back here in the United States, something we've talked about on this program before with you, Larry. But it doesn't seem to be subsiding. Some of the turmoil, the roiling on college campuses right across the country uh, as people pick up sides and a lot of anti-Semitism, frankly, is being expressed. Uh, what do you think we are right now and what can be done, particularly by the leadership of universities? It's a it remains a, a difficult, very difficult issue. Look, everybody should be allowed to have their say without being uh, explicitly uh, punished, even if that say offends people. No one should uh, be doxxed. But every university president in America has a playbook for these kinds of situations. It's the way they've responded to racial incidents or homophobic incidents on their campus. And the issue this month of anti-Semitic uh, incidents is just as serious, maybe in many ways more serious, given what we saw, for example, at uh, Cornell. And universities need to go to that playbook, which they've used often in the past, and too many universities have, I'm very sorry to say, a double standard where anti-Semitism doesn't get the same uh, regard. Yeah, let's, let's absolutely debate the rules about free speech and hate speech and universities' involvement in politics. Those are important debates to have, but let's have a single standard for all kinds of uh, prejudice. David, I've seen a lot, and I was somebody who was worrying about anti-Semitism and BDS and boycott Israel and all of that uh, 20 years ago. But I have to say that I have been profoundly surprised and disappointed by what I have seen since these Hamas attacks on many college campuses but on uh, many other places as uh, well. And that is something that I think all of us have to take seriously. I have been very glad to see the powerful way in which President Biden has addressed these issues in general and the way in which he and his colleagues in the Education Department have addressed them in the, co in the context of uh, college campuses. And I hope that that's going to be an inspiration to others around these issues going forward.